We're going to continue in our Wednesday night series. This is our bridge service, as we've been calling it. And we, we're, I'm trying to use this, this, these Wednesday night services to just be a blessing to you, to encourage you in your walk with the Lord, and to help you to make it from Sunday to Sunday. You know, we get that spiritual food. We really get immersed in the Word of God on Sundays. We're, you know, we, Sunday school lesson, a Bible study, and then a sermon on Sunday morning, and then a sermon on Sunday night, or a Bible study on Sunday night. And I feel like that is a real blessing, and it's really needful in our lives to have that time with God's people, to have that time immersed in the Word of God. Uh, but just doing that once a week, I think, is would be lacking if that's all the time that we got to spend with God's people, and that's the only time we spent t- together corporately in God's Word. And so um, we're going to continue in this series that I hope is a blessing to you. I hope that it will be encouraging to you and, and help you on your way. Turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, and... The series is titled Steps to Grow By, and we've been in this series now, counting tonight. This is our sixth week in this series. This is the sixth message, and uh, you can certainly, uh, you know, have gone through and figured out exactly how long this series would last if you're paying attention in your own Bible reading, and so turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to pick up reading in verse 3 and read our passage together. It says here, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. So he's given us everything we need to mature, uh, to mature spiritually and to grow spiritually. And among those things are some promises, whereby are given unto us. Whereby, whereby the the glory and the virtue, whereby the knowledge, whereby the person through the knowledge of him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ who makes all this possible, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, by all these things that God has provided for us, the salvation, uh, all of the information and all the truth and all of the steps that we need to grow spiritually, he says that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. We get to be transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ. I don't want you to lose the wonder of that truth, the wonder of that statement. That, that God who came in the flesh, he desires that we would be transformed into his image. That we would be made like him. That we could be adopted in his, into his family and become joint heirs with Christ. How marvelous a, a reality that that is. And it can be a reality. It doesn't have to be just a, a bunch of uh, spiritual platitudes that you hear week in, week out uh, throughout your life as a person who goes to church. This can be a spiritual reality in your life that you are becoming day by day, week by week, more like Christ. And everything we need to make that happen has been provided. Now, in our text, he says not only that we would become partakers of the divine nature, but it says having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We don't have to live like sinners anymore. What's, what's the matter? Stay by the pulpit. This isn't working. Okay, interesting. Well, there's no reason to me carrying this thing around then. This thing weighs a, like half a pound. All right, I'll stay by the pulpit. Do you know how difficult that is going to be for me to stay by the pulpit? All right, let's see if I can do it. So, not only does he want us to become like Christ, he wants us to become different from what we were, which is sort of implicit in becoming like Christ, right? Because we weren't like Christ before, now we're becoming like Christ, but we want to leave behind that old sinful lifestyle and leave behind uh, the old choices that you would have made, that we would have made, and make a different kind of choice going forward. So then he begins to lay out in a, in a very simple series of steps, thus the title of our series, Steps to Grow By, how we can see this progression that he just described for us in, the, in, in these first two verses, how we can see that come to fruition in our lives. He says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Right, so we understand, I've, I've emphasized this many times throughout our series, that spiritual growth is not something that happens automatically just because you call yourself a Christian. Spiritual growth is not something that automatically happens just because you attend church somewhere. Right? Spiritual growth 
is not even something that's going to happen automatically, even by just exercising a, a small uh, collection of spiritual disciplines in your life. There are some specific steps, some specific things, as he says here, that we need to act to add to our faith. The faith being your salvation. The faith being the uh, being born again through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary. Add to your salvation. Add to your faith these things. And you need to do it diligently. By the way, uh, the addition of these things that we've talked about, virtue and knowledge and, uh, and, and to uh, uh, temperance and patience. And last week we learned about godliness. It's not as though you just make one choice at one moment. I'm going to add knowledge. And you add knowledge that one time and then you're done with that. Right? So my little ones, they like to use blocks. We have blocks. And they like to build with them. And, and they'll add, right? They'll just start with a base or start with a few blocks with, with which they create a foundation. And then they begin to add to that. Once you've added a block, that block's been added. Right? When it comes to building with blocks, it's pretty simple. But adding your faith is not like adding blocks to a, a, a simple structure that you build as a two-year-old. This is something you have to continue diligently in. You continue to add virtue. You continue to add uh, uh, knowledge. You continue to add patience. You, can, you continue to add temperance. You continue to add godliness. These are all things... That you have to do on a continual basis. He says, giving all diligence, add to your faith. And then we begin to list these things. I've listed them a couple times already. But he says, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience. And then last week we saw, and to patience godliness. Remember, we talked about godliness being an outward show of Christ-likeness or God-likeness. We, we also summed it up in one word, a, a word that we're familiar with as independent Baptists. That is the word separation, being separated from the world and separated unto God. This is a good thing. This is a necessary thing. This is a, can I say it, godly thing for us to publicly demonstrate, to work out our faith in a visible manner. That's one step. That, that is to say, listen, your faith should not be just your private faith, and that's all there is to it. I've heard uh, some politicians who act and make decisions and vote in ways that are contrary to the Word of God say, oh, I'm not against faith. I'm not against Christianity. I'm not against the Bible. You can believe whatever you want to believe in the privacy of your home, in the privacy of your church. But as soon as you start living out that faith and walk out those doors and living your faith and speaking your faith in public forums and social media, uh, knocking doors on street corners or whatever the case may be, however it is that you're living out your faith in a public, visible way, then they have a problem with it. Right? But that's precisely what we're supposed to do. If we're going to grow, we need to start living out that faith, especially when it comes to godliness, holiness, uh, holy living. We live out that faith. And many would call that aspect religion or religiousness, right? But we want to go further now this evening. And we're going to continue with the next one. It says, uh, the last thing we read in verse 6, And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, he says, brotherly kindness. Add to godliness, brotherly kindness. You grow spiritually by adding brotherly kindness to your faith. Now, as, as our pattern has been, we want to define brotherly kindness. Now, brotherly kindness, I think, is a very simple term to define because it's pretty self-explanatory. Brotherly kindness, in other words, is literally a love or kindness or compassion or service for your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a love, kindness, service, compassion for the brethren. Brotherly kindness is the love of the brethren. And, and, and I want to go further in defining it. Let's, let's make sure that we let the Bible define it for us. Not just, don't just take my word for it. First of all, let's talk about who it means when it talks about the brethren or your brothers or sisters. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. This is... Still a part of our introductory statements. Again, the, the, the propositional statement tonight is that you grow spiritually by adding brotherly kindness to your faith. 
And uh, we're talking about what does that mean to express or to live out a brotherly kindness, to add that to your faith. Well, here in Matthew chapter 12, we're going to start reading in verse 46. Jesus is in a, in a building, in a room, in a space, uh, preaching and teaching to his disciples. And it says in verse 46, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without. Now, there have been some in certain religious circles that have made the claim that Jesus uh, was immaculately, not only was, um, okay, what am I trying to say? That not only was Jesus uh, conceived of a virgin, but that she remained a virgin. She never had any more children, Mary. And even they would go so far as to say that Mary was immaculately conceived. There are people who make those arguments. But I think the Bible is pretty clear, especially here in this verse here. And there are other, many other passages that talk about Jesus' brothers and sisters. And this one, though, is very unique because it makes the distinction between the spiritual term brothers and his physical family. And so Jesus is in a room with his disciples, teaching them. His mom and his brothers are outside the building, it says. And, and his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. So they showed up, they found out Jesus was here and they want to talk with Jesus. Who knows what it's about? Probably nothing huge, but they want to talk to him. They want to interrupt what he's doing in order to talk to him about something about in their family, perhaps. So in verse 47, it says, then one, that is one who was in the room with, with him, maybe one who was at the edge of the room, maybe one who was at a window or at a doorway and could see that his family was outside, his physical family was outside. Then one said unto him, behold, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? So some, some have tried to argue that when it says his mother and his brethren were outside, that he was just talking about spiritual, spiritually speaking brethren. But, but he, he clearly distinguishes between those who were his physical, she was who was his physical mother, and those who were his physical brothers, and the spiritual brothers that were in the room with him. He's, he's, then he stretches forth his hand toward his disciples and says, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. So, again... When we talk about the brethren, when we talk about brothers and sisters in Christ, what we're talking about is those who are our spiritual family. Those who are Christians beside us. Those who are our brothers and sisters, spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers, spiritual children. People who maybe helped give birth to you spiritually. They shared the faith with, faith with you. Or maybe they found you as an immature Christian and they taught you and they poured their life into you. And they helped you to grow in your faith and they became like a mother or like a father to you, they literally became a spiritual father just as Timothy became a spiritual son and Paul became a spiritual father to Timothy. He didn't lead him to Christ. He was already saved when, when Paul met him and yet he became a spiritual father to him. Jesus says, those who do the will of the Father, those who are born again, those who are saved, those are your brothers and sisters. So when we talk about the brethren here in this this. Uh, discipline that we're adding to our spiritual lives. We're talking about brothers and sisters in Christ, particularly. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't love other people, right? You can remember the parable that Jesus told uh, of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Good Samaritan, and how he. Uh, was passed by, he was a Jewish man who was waylaid on the highway, and he was passed by by some Jewish brethren who ignored him. And yet it was the Samaritan man who would have been disdained and hated by the Jewish man in any other circumstance who stopped and helped him. And then at the end, you remember, Jesus said, who is your neighbor? Who was his neighbor in this instance? They were talking about the, the commandments. Uh, love thy neighbor as thyself. He's, oh, I, I, I love my neighbor. Oh, yeah, I love the brother. And he says, so, so certainly we're not trying to make the case that you shouldn't love, you know, anybody out there. But in particular, we're talking about a love for your spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's who the brethren are. Now, what about this issue of kindness or love, as I've been saying? Uh, turn with me to Philemon, another introductory passage before we get into the points of the message. This evening, Philemon chapter 1, and we're just going to read a few verses starting in verse 4. Philemon chapter 1, starting in verse 4. He says, I thank my God 
making mention of thee always in my prayers. Wouldn't you love to be in one of these in one of these lists or in one of these statements that Paul made? If you had if if you could have lived during that time to have been one of the individuals that Paul makes this kind of statement about, every time I pray, you come to mind. And in not one of those situations where you're like the squeaky wheel that's always getting the oil. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's more, he thinks of him because he just wants to thank God for him. Remember that, that he says this here to this man he's writing to in the book of Philemon, but he also says it in the book of Philippians. I thank God for you every time I pray, he says to them as well. You know, and, and so it would be great to be one of these people. Apparently this man was one of those people. He says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. Why? Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou, listen, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual. He's praying this. He's praying, I'm praying that how you live out and how you work out your faith would become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus, for we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. What's so great about this guy? Because he loves the brethren. And specifically, when we say love or when we say kindness, we're not talking about the statement, I love you, brother. Don't get me wrong. We ought to make that statement. We say that when we're talking about marriage. Husbands, tell your wives you love them. Wives, tell your husband that you love him. That, that's, a, that's a wise thing to do. But love is not simply a statement. As is clearly described here in the book of Philemon, the reason that, that, that Paul was so thankful and expressed that thankfulness in his prayers every time he prayed to God for this, this gentleman here is because this person was someone who loved the brethren in a very active kind of love. He was investing in them. He was helping them. He was consoling them. Okay, if they had a need, he would meet the need. So when we talk about brotherly kindness, you grow spiritually by adding brotherly kindness. We understand that what we're talking about is actively investing in and meeting the needs of and living for and serving your brothers and sisters in Christ. By the way, when we, I, I said that when we talk about godliness, we, talk, we think of that as religiousness, this outward act, action of religion. But the Bible tells us in the book of James that real religion is this kind of religion. The kind of religion that serves. The kind of religion that sacrifices for the benefit of others. And particularly that religion which loves and serves and has compassion for and invests in the lives of your fellow followers of Jesus Christ. You grow spiritually by adding this kind of brotherly kindness to your faith. There's three things I want to talk with you about concerning the benefit of and why it's so important, the benefit of adding, and why it's so important to add brotherly kindness to your life, to your faith. Number one, let's talk about the source of brotherly kindness. If we're going to add brotherly kindness, we need to know where it comes from. We need to know, we need to know where the motivation for it comes from. What is it that is going to inspire this in us? Now, there may be some of us who have uh, a greater propensity for this kind of love toward anybody. But even those who this sort of activity does not, for those who this sort of activity does not come naturally, there is a source from which you can gain the, the propensity for this. You can gain the instinct for this. You can gain the reflex for this. There are some who, if they see someone in need, they just reflexively want to meet the need, whether they've got the means to meet the need or not. And there are others who need to develop that and, and to build that in themselves. What is the source of this all necessary brotherly love? Well, uh, we're, our passage is in 2 Peter chapter 1. Turn with me just a few pages back in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. Our passage is in 2 Peter. Turn with me, though, to 1 Peter chapter 1. 
and we're going to look at verses 22 and 23. First Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 22, it says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, listen to this, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. So what he's saying is here that salvation, something that ought to be added to your faith, something that ought to be a natural addition to your faith, is an unfeigned love of the brethren. Unfeigned. That means it's not fake. You don't have to, uh, you, you don't have to pretend to love the brethren. You know, you shouldn't have to come to church and put on a fake smile and pretend to love the brethren. You ought to love them simply because of who they are in Christ. And what Christ, because if Christ loved them, we ought to love them too. He says, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth of the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Because you're saved. This is something that comes naturally, but he says, see that you do it. See that you do it. It ought to come naturally, but you know what? Whether it comes naturally or not, see that you do it. Make sure that you continue. Make sure to be diligent in this, as it says in 2 Peter chapter 1. Diligently add this to your faith. Listen, and then what it says in verse 23, this is the point we're getting to. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now, notice that it says, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And then you've got a little colon there, right? That means what's about to be said follows this. It's attached to this being born again by the word of God. So it is the word of God, which is the source for an unfeigned brotherly love or brotherly kindness it is the word of god that is the source listen if, if you're struggling with your love of the brethren then you must also be struggling with your love of the word because if you love the word and if you're reading the word and if you're pouring the word into you it will produce in you a love for the brethren because it becomes abundantly clear that jesus loves the brethren he gave himself for us every single one of us and how, be it far from you or be it far from me to dismiss the need to love a particular brother or a particular sister because there's something in my flesh that, finds a, that I find abhorrent in their flesh. So I just can't get along with that person. Or our personalities just clash. Well, forget your personality. How about, you let, how about you do this? How about you let God's word reshape your personality? Because there's a problem with your personality if you've got a problem with one of God's children. And if you do have a problem with one of God's children, you need to go get it right, and you probably ought to do it tonight. Get it right. Don't, don't stick, don't, do not stay in that condition. Do not stay with, the, do not put up with that sort of attitude in yourself. He says, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently. <laughs> so um, when I talk to my kids about obeying, we talked about our little mantras we have that define certain things. And we have one of those for obedience. You do it. Here's how you, this is how you obey. You do it fast. And here's the, here's the kicker with a good attitude. So if you do it, but you do it slow, you didn't obey. If you do it, and you do it fast, but you've got a fallen countenance, you didn't obey. You've got to do it fervently. You have to do it with a good attitude. And that's hard when you don't want to do it. It was funny, uh, just tonight before service, Thea and Nora were playing up here in the front. And Nora was sitting there. They were playing church or something, right? So Nora's sitting in the, in the chair, and Thea is sitting in the chair where our, our person who does sign language interpretation sits. And she had a hymnal open, and she was flipping through it. And it always just, I don't know how you are. I'm protective toward books, any book, really. But when it comes to hymn books and Bibles, they're made with really fine pages, and they're, not, they're really just not made to be handled by two-year-olds. They're just not. 
And so I'm watching her flip through this, and I'm just like, okay, she's going to tear out half the pages in that book. So I walk over to her, and I said, Thea, this is one of our nice hymnals. And it is. There was a nicer hymnal, one of the newer hymnals sitting there. I said, this is one of our nice hymnals. You can't play with this book. And I closed it. And she looked at me, and she said, okay, I want to play with it. <laughs> so she tried to obey, but she couldn't help herself. She said, but daddy, I want to play with it. I was like, yeah, I know you want to play with it. That's why I told you not to play with it. And uh, so she wasn't fervently obeying because even she, she, she could, you know, she didn't have the guile to, to hide that, right? She didn't have that kind of guile yet. But even though she had, had obeyed on the surface, she wasn't obeying fervently because her heart wasn't in it. You can't just put on a good face around that person that you have a fleshly problem with. You need to love them with your whole heart. What does it say there? In, uh, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Do it with everything you've got. And that means if there's a problem, you're just going to have to deal with the problem. Amen? Humbly. Deal with the problem humbly. That means you don't go with them and say, hey, let me flick that chip off your shoulder. Ha! <laughs> no, no, humbly. See yourself as a servant. That's how you deal with conflict as Christians. So the word of God is the source of brotherly love. If you want to add brotherly love, add more Bible to your life. If you're having struggle, if you're struggling with love at a certain brother, get in God's word and ask God for help and he'll help you. He'll give you what you need. So we see number one, the source of brotherly love. And also we could, I could have added this as part of the source. The, the, the written word is the source, but also the living word is the source. We love them because he loved them, Right? We love the church. Why? Because he loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, you, you ought to love the church. Christians, you say they're Christians and they love God and they don't love a church and they're not involved in a local church. I have a problem with that. Okay, there's a problem in your heart because you don't love what God loves. You don't love it fervently and you don't love it with your whole heart if you're not involved in joining and getting involved in serving and doing everything you can and using the gifts that God gave you in your local church because, by the way, that's why he puts you in a local church, not just so you can warm a seat, not just so that you can fill the coffers, so that you can use your spiritual gift to profit with all, as it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we love the brethren because... God's word produces that in us and because Jesus loves the brethren. That's the source of brotherly love. Number two, not only do we want to look at the source of brotherly love, but tonight I want to look at the purpose of brotherly love. And to clarify, I'm not saying that we love the brethren to accomplish some other purpose. I'm saying brotherly love is the purpose. The purpose of brotherly love. The purpose which is brotherly love. Brotherly love is one of the primary purposes of of our faith, of our role as believers in Jesus Christ, one of the primary purposes in God's mind, in God's heart, in making us followers of his, is that we would love the brethren like he does. He wants to make us a part of a community of faith. He wants to build a community of faith. He wants Jesus to be the firstborn among many brethren who love each other with a pure heart fervently. That's the purpose of brotherly love. So we're going to look at a couple passages here. First of all, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and we'll start reading in verse 13. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. So this is um, talking about spiritual liberty. And um, we, we are saved and we are given liberty as followers of Jesus Christ. Now, this isn't necessarily directly talking about our subject tonight, but it applies, as you'll see in a minute. But that's what's, what he's talking about. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Absolutely, it's true. Religious liberty, spiritual liberty, Christian liberty, right? We're not under the law anymore. There's not a... It's not a list of do's and don'ts that makes you right with God. It's the blood of Christ that makes you right with God. But then he says this, only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh. The point of liberty is not liberty. <laughs> God didn't make you free just so you could be free. Right? It's, God didn't go into the zoo and open all the cages and say, have at it. He freed us for a purpose. What's that purpose? Only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh. 
Don't enable your flesh. Don't, don't, um, don't look for opportunities to, to feed the weak areas in your, in your life, in your sin life, in your sinful past. Don't use liberty as an excuse to um, set yourself up for a fall, is essentially what he's saying. He says, only use not liberty for an occasion of flesh, but by love serve one another. You know what the purpose of liberty is? You're free to serve. You're free to love. You're free to, to, to truly serve God and to truly serve your brethren and to truly love your brethren. For all the law, he says, is fulfilled in one word, even this, one truth, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So what we're saying here is one of the primary purposes of your faith is brotherly kindness, is to produce this community and this community can only work as long as we are exercising brotherly kindness, brotherly love toward one another. We see the opposite of that going on in our culture right now, right? We see elements of our culture literally pulling themselves apart at the seams. A nation, a kingdom, Jesus said, divided against itself can not stand. And if there, it, where there is a lack of brotherly love and where there is a lack of brotherly kindness in any kind of community, that community will fall. And so the same holds true for the local church. The, the same holds true for the work of God. This, this, now we understand that the work of God as a whole, the local church as an entity, as, as, a, as, a, as a thing that exists, will, is not completely dependent upon the existence of this one church. But I'm not okay with this church going away. I would not be okay with this church pulling itself apart at the seams. Because this church is important. This church is my church. This church is your church. And we need to invest in it. One of the primary purposes of God putting us together in this church as a church family is so that we could love one another. And use our spiritual gifts to that end. The purpose of brotherly love. Turn also to 1 Peter chapter 3. You were in Galatians chapter 5. Turn now to 1 Peter chapter 3. And we'll start reading in verse 8. First Peter chapter 3 verse 8. He says, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. <laughs> Full of pity, you know, for one another. Have pity for one another. Be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. Listen, there's going to be times when as brothers, sisters in Christ, some of us are going to have a bad day or we're going to have a bad week or we're going to have a bad month or we're going to have a bad year. It's going to happen. And, and there's going to be times when someone will say something or do something that's mean or nasty or inappropriate or wicked or whatever, but we don't have to return it. Especially when it comes to the brethren, when it comes to a church, when it comes to brothers, sisters of Christ. He says, listen, love is brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise, blessing. Someone rails against you, bless them. Someone uh, uh, is evil toward you, bless them. No, listen, here's the key. Here's what, what I was getting to. Knowing that ye are there unto called. This is the purpose. This is the point. God sent his son to save you so that that which is in you, which is created in his image, could be redeemed. Because there was nothing lovable or redeemable in me before I got saved, except for that which was in God's image. So he, he, he died on the cross to save me, but he also died on the cross to make this community, to make the brethren. And it was to that purpose, for, there, for, for ye are there unto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. We get to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We, we get to have a group of people who love us and invest in us, and in turn we get to love them and invest in them. For he that will love life and see good days, let him afraid his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. This goes for your relationship with all men and all women, but particularly with the brothers and sisters in Christ. 
So we see, number one, the, per, the source of brotherly love. It's the word of God. It's the, the written word and the living word. Number two, we see the purpose of brotherly love. The brotherly love is one of the primary purposes of God saving you so that you can be part of a, a community of faith, a local church, and love the brethren. And then finally, number three, the blessing of brotherly love. There's some, there's some fringe benefits to exercising brotherly love. It's, it, it, it is a blessing. Um, so we're going to look at two passages. First one is 1 John chapter 3. We're going to be in 1 John for both of these passages. So, 1 John chapter 3 is the first one, though. We're looking at our third idea, the third truth about brotherly love that the Bible teaches us, and it is the blessing of brotherly love. There's two things that God's Word shares with us as being blessings in exercising brotherly love. First of all, 1 John 3, 14. He says, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So, brotherly love is a blessing, number one. It's a blessing because it gives us assurance of our faith. It, it gives us assurance of our faith. So, 1 John chapter 5, he tells us, These things are written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. So, you could read this verse here, and you could say, Well, okay, I could use this verse to prove someone is not saved. <laughs> right? You, you, could, you could make that argument. But that's not the point of what John is writing. He's not writing this to convince you you're not saved. He's writing this to give you ammunition to help you to give you assurance that you are saved. Someone, if you're someone who has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're fighting with doubt, doubting your salvation, he says, listen, here's some stuff to help you with that. That's what this is for. This is not for you to use to disprove someone else's salvation. By the way, that's not your job as a Christian is go around disproving other people's salvation. It's, it's given to you to be a blessing to you in order to get, help you with assurance of your own salvation. You have believed on Lord Jesus Christ. You're fighting with doubt of your salvation. Start loving the brethren the way you ought to. Guess what will happen to that doubt? It'll just fly away. It'll sprout wings and fly away. And you're like, was I, did I ever doubt my salvation? What happened to that? Well, you started doing some of the stuff that John says you ought to do, and it just went away on its own. So, so brotherly love is a blessing because when you immerse yourself in the word of God and you immerse yourself in the love of the brethren from a, from a, from a pure heart, fervently, as it says there in 1 Peter chapter 1, all those doubts just start flying away. So we see the blessing of brotherly love in the assurance that it gives us. There's another thing, though. So I did say that it's not there to disprove salvation, but it can, it can help us to understand when there's wolves among us, right? We can use that. It, it, it can help us with that. Turn to 1 John chapter 4. Maybe you don't have to turn. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 says this. If a man say, I love God, I, I'm, I voiced this just a moment ago. I talked about someone says they love God, but they don't love their church. They're not involved in their church. They, they could care less about church. Church is just a secondary thing. There's a problem there. John makes the same argument when it comes to brotherly love. He says, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. <laughs> John is so black and white, man. <laughs> what did I say earlier? I said, if you say you love God, but you don't love your local church like you're supposed to, I, what did I say? There's a problem there. There's a problem there. John just says, you're a liar. I, I don't believe you. That's what John says. Prove it, is what John is saying. Prove it. If a man say, I love God and hated his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Kids, that's what I warn you about being obedient to your parents. If you don't learn how to obey your parents now, if you can't obey your your physical father who you can see and hear with an audible voice, what makes you think you're going to be able to follow God and obey God when you get out on your own? It's not going to happen. If, you, if, you're a, if you're a rebel in your heart now toward your father, toward your earthly father, you will be a rebel in your heart when you leave your home. No doubt about it. You need to get that right. 
If a man say, I love God and hated his brother, he's a liar. Because if you can't love a brother that you can see right from you, right in front of you, who, <laughs> right in front of you, who has been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, who has made a joint heir with Christ, if you can't love that person, even with all their quirks and foibles, I understand people, we're all weird in our own way, right? Especially me. How are you going to love God who you can't see? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God, love his brother also. John's pretty clear. If you say you love God, you better love the brethren. Love your church. Love the people God has given you in your church. And by the way, remember this, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. The grass is always greener until you get there. And then it's not so green. It's funny, I was, I was looking out my window uh, the other day, and we have this area, this, this grassy area outside of our, our uh, uh, family room, I guess we call it. And uh, we have these windows, and you can see the grassy area, and there's a little retaining wall now. And, and so I was looking at it, it looks so green and so verdant and so nice. And then I went out there, and I looked down, and it's brown. <laughs> And I thought, what in the world? <laughs> How does it look so green inside, but then when I get out there, it was brown. And the problem was, is my perspective. My perspective skewed my perception of what I was seeing. See, what I was seeing was all the grass in the whole yard at an angle, right? Got this whole yard, and then I turned it at an angle so that I'm seeing all of that grass. And that's what I was seeing green. But when I stood out on top of it, I saw tons of brown. And tons of bare spots where there was no grass at all. And what had looked so verdant and so green and so lush and so wonderful was really kind of, I don't want to walk on that. See. Distance can skew your perspective. Um, so what is this? What, what, what good is this? So again, this reinforces what was said in chapter 3 about assurance, but I think this also talks of discernment. Brotherly love is a blessing in that it gives us assurance, but it also gives us discernment. You know, because if someone comes in and they refuse to love the brethren, maybe your, your antenna, your radar starts pinging on something. Sonar, I guess that's what, what uh, uh, submarines use. And starts pinging on something like, oh, there's something out there. There's something I need to pay attention to here. Maybe the Holy Spirit of God is telling me to be a little vigilant here. Because someone's saying one thing, but they're doing something completely different. Someone says they love the brethren, but they come to you and all they can do is complain and, 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 and murmur against the pastor or the assistant pastor or whatever. That, that's all they ever want to talk about. Maybe you should just take that person by the arm and say, let's go talk to the preacher about it. And they'll pull their arm away like, no, I'm not going to go talk to the preacher about it. Then, then why are you talking to me about it? I assumed you were looking for moral support for someone to go help you do, take care of this biblically. <laughs> so let's go. That's, I, I can't think of any other reason you'd be talking to me about it. Unless you're a wolf who's trying to build a pack to go after the preacher. The preacher, not the preacher. Or any other brother, by the way. It's not just the preacher we ought to defend. It's not just the preacher we ought to look out for. We ought to look, for, look out for everybody. Look out for each other. There's three things we looked at tonight. The source of brotherly love, the purpose of brotherly love, and the blessing of brotherly love. And all these things, when we put them together, what do we come to the conclusion of? You grow spiritually by adding brotherly kindness to your faith. Add godliness, but not just the look of godliness. This is the practical godliness. This is the practical religion. The source of brotherly kindness is God's word. Brotherly kindness is a primary purpose for your faith. And the blessing of brotherly kindness is the discernment and assurance it offers. Add to your godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness.